This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Do you ever think about switching insurance companies to see if you could save some cash? Progressive makes it easy to see if you could save when you bundle your home and auto policies. Try it at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. It is Monday, October 28th, 2024. Welcome back to Hang Up and Listen, Slate Sports Podcast. Back with you again. I'm Alex Kirshner. I'm a contributing writer for Slate, where I write about all kinds of sports topics. And I co-host Split Zone Duo, a national college football podcast. I've got my usual esteemed panel this week, and we have lots to discuss. We will go over a handful of things that are pretty timely this time of year. The lack of explicit political endorsements from active athletes is one of them. Michael Jordan's antitrust fight against NASCAR, where he owns the team, is another. We'll talk about Bronny James, the return of the NBA, and the storylines that we are most interested in in that league, in addition to the one that uh, seemed to have everyone's attention in the league's first week of the 2024-25 season. It'll be a great show. Back this week for it is Ben Lindbergh. He is a senior editor for The Ringer and is the co-host of the Effectively Wild podcast. He is the co-author of The MVP Machine, How Baseball's New Nonconformists Are Using Data to Build Better Players and the Only Rule is It Has to Work, Our Wild Experiment Building a New Kind of Baseball Team. You may know him from his previous work at 538 in Grantland or as the editor-in-chief of Baseball Prospectus. I know him as the guy who cursed the New York Yankees when he did not get a ring from their 2009 championship. And as we record this, it looks like that may continue, though we will touch on it in more detail next week or so after the series is wrapped up. Yes, I'm burning sage to cleanse the curse, not only on Aaron Judge's pitch recognition, but also on Shohei Otani's shoulder, hoping for the best. Otherwise, just savoring the last week in the broadcasting career of Yankees radio legend John Sterling, who, as we record on Monday, has not yet had a chance to utter a the Yankees win in this World Series. And as usual, we have Lindsay Gibbs with us. Lindsay is the author and founder of Power Place, a bi-weekly newsletter that adds key context to the biggest women's sports stories of the moment. She was formerly the co-host of the feminist sports podcast, Burn It All Down. She has written for Business Insider, The Athletic, The Ringer, Bleacher Report, and USA Today, among many other outlets. And now she joins us frequently here on Hang Up. Lindsay, hello. How are you? Hello. I'm doing great. NBA is back. WNBA offseason is off to the most dramatic start possible. You know, there really is no off season here at Hang Up, though. So glad to be here with you all. No, we are 365 at Hang Up and Listen, (laughs) or at least or at least once every seven days for 365. (laughs) Before we get into our business, as always, we want to thank our Slate Plus members for making this show possible. One method of saying thanks is with a bonus episode. This week, we will talk about the life of the late great Fernando Valenzuela, who died last week at 63, a real legend. You can hear that episode right now as long as you are a Slate Plus member. Subscribe by going to Apple Podcasts and clicking Try Free at the top of our show page or visit slate.com slash hangupplus to get access wherever you listen. There is a presidential election next week. Maybe you've heard about it. One of the big stories of this past week was about non-endorsements in that presidential election from major newspapers. The Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times, two of the nation's great papers, yanked plans to endorse a candidate that was going to be Kamala Harris in each case, with the owner of each paper reportedly weighing in to put the kibosh on an editorial in Harris's favor. And it got us thinking that the sports world has been pretty endorsement averse this time around too. Yes, both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris have plenty of public support from athletes, but the vast majority of it is from former athletes, not current ones. The Harris campaign launched Athletes for Harris in late September, but nearly all of its members are former players, not current ones. You've got names like Magic Johnson and Billie Jean King and Steve Kerr and Ali Krieger and Candace Parker. LeBron James, who endorsed or even stumped for the Democrat the last few times Trump was on the ballot, has not yet come out for Harris in this race. Trump has a bit more endorsement traction among active athletes, especially in combat sports, where he's kind of a cult hero. But there are even more athletes who have simply 
you know, taken pictures that suggest they might favor Trump, or in the case of Nick Bosa last evening of the San Francisco 49ers, flashed a Make America Great Again hat during a Sunday night football interview that he crashed, but then didn't want to say much about it when he was asked about it in a press conference afterward and only said that this was an important time. Brett Favre is on the stump this week for Trump in Wisconsin, but again, that's a former athlete. And it seems like current athletes, even when they've wanted to show some support for one candidate or the other, have been a bit circumspect about doing so in a detailed way. Ben, do you worry that unless Jared Goff weighs in, the people of Michigan will be left without guidance on whether they should go for Harris or Trump? Yeah, it's funny. Back in July, there were widely shared assertions online that Jared Goff, Joe Burrow, and Daniel Jones had joined a white dudes for Harris Zoom call, but those claims were debunked. So we can be confident that they are white dudes, but we still don't know whether they are in fact for Harris. I guess the Michigan vote will come down to Eminem versus Kid Rock. But I think there are a couple of questions here. One, why aren't athletes speaking up at least active ones, and two, how much will it matter, if at all? As for the first question, clearly the political climate has changed since 2020 when so many athletes, including Jared Goff, were vocal in the wake of George Floyd's murder and LeBron was leading the More Than a Vote campaign. But The Economist published a study last month on how, quote unquote, wokeness has receded somewhat since then. The most salient issues in the race have shifted. Hence, LeBron handing off leadership of more than a vote to Neka Ogumake of the Seattle Storm, who's assembled a coalition of female athletes, including Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart, to talk about women's rights and reproductive freedom. Plus, almost a decade into the Trump era of presidential politics, I think a lot of us are just tired. <laughs> We're just feeling fatigue and or apathy. There's a limit to how many times the this is the most important election of your lifetime message resonates, even if it continues to be true. So everyone's wondering whether turnout will decline accordingly, which in theory makes high profile endorsements matter more. But that takes us to the second question of whether it will matter. There's been a lot of research about whether celebrity endorsements make a difference, and the consensus seems to be not much. Just because you enjoy someone's art or athleticism doesn't mean you're going to follow their lead when it comes to political candidates. So if you have a famous, respected, largely apolitical figure supporting a lesser-known candidate in a primary, let's say, as Oprah did with Barack Obama in 2008, that might matter. But otherwise, eh. LeBron has endorsed three different Democratic presidential candidates and tweeted about Trump being a bum. So while his silence is conspicuous, it wouldn't surprise anyone if he did endorse Harris. And the country is just so politically polarized that there aren't many undecided voters anyway. And if Taylor Swift supporting Harris and Trump subsequently saying he hated Taylor Swift can't break the polling deadlock, then I don't know if any athlete can. Lindsay, the WNBA is an interesting case because this has probably been the most um, politically engaged of the major professional sports leagues, largely to its credit. And I think it's been a reason why um, it's been able to sort of grow its tent among the increasing level of, of basketball stardom and quality of play that we've seen in that league. Do you think there's any reason that you've noted in, in women's sports in particular that things seem a touch more muted on the endorsement front this time around than four years ago? Yeah, I think there's multiple reasons. First of all, I can't tell if it is more muted or if it's just that endorsements and any speaking out is having less resonance because we're used to it and we're all kind of, like you said, like there's a level of fatigue. To that point, I had forgotten that Steph Curry actually uh, did an endorsement video at the DNC, right, for mm -hmm. Kamala Harris. Like that had completely left my mind uh, before I started researching for this particular episode. Of course, Steve Kerr spoke in person there. Also, apparently, the entire U.S. Women's National Basketball Team at the Olympics did endorse uh, Kamala Harris and um, said that, you know, they were all kind of staying together. There was reports from um, The Next has done good coverage of this. Brianna Stewart and Cheryl Reeve both spoke out saying that, you know, they're all excited to do what they can to back Kamala as much as possible. And that the things, I think the quote from Cheryl Reeve is the things that she stands for, we also stand for. So, you know, those are very inclusive statements, but that barely made a dent. Also, I didn't even see that come across my um, 
research until I was researching for this specifically. And now I used to very much be on the athlete endorsement beat back when I worked for Think Progress, which was a progressive political newsroom. And I was their sports reporter and I worked there during election seasons and, you know, would keep track of that stuff as my literal job. So maybe I'm just not paying as close of attention. Maybe it's a personal thing. But I do think there's something to, oh, we expect people in the W to be endorsing um, Kamala Harris. We expect players like LeBron and Steph to be endorsing her. And it doesn't really matter them speaking up. It's just a formality at this point. Unfortunately, that's also like really cynical. Like, I do think it does matter to some degree. Does any one thing matter in totality? No, but every little thing can add up to something that matters. And I think every bit of press we can get for supporting Kamala and every bit of impact that each individual can make, I have to believe that it matters. I'm not putting the election results on LeBron James back, but uh, that's too much for any one person. But I do think it's disappointing that he hasn't used his platform in this way. And look, Another element to this is, and I heard Leja Clarendon, uh, WNBA player now retired, but was active this season, say that in 2020, it was much easier for the league to organize because it was the pandemic and they were all in one spot, right? They were all in one place. The bubble had lots of disadvantages, of course, but yeah. its advantage was they were all together and they became mobilized because one of the owners, then Kelly Leffler, was she owned the Atlanta Dream and she was actually a senator. She got nabbed as a senator and then was using her position as a Republican senator and a WNBA owner to disparage Black Lives Matter, to disparage the women in the league. So the WNBA very naturally got brought into this election and started campaigning actively for Senator Warnock in Georgia. And they really made a difference there in um increasing uh, Warnock's profile early in his race. And ultimately, of course, he went on to defeat Leffler in the runoff and, you know, help literally change the balance of power in the Senate. So I don't know that you can follow that up with more impact. And I do think that WNBA players struggled a little bit to organize as a unit this season in because A, they're spread across the country, B, it was the most chaotic and busy WNBA season in history. There was a lot of noise. And C, they were preparing, the labor union was a little bit busy preparing for the upcoming collective bargaining agreement fight. So, you know, I have a few more points, but I think that just kind of leaves us with this is a little bit more complicated. Also, the actual endorsements we're getting isn't aren't having the resonance that maybe they once did. But there also is, I think, a little bit more cowardice and a little bit more hedging your bets when it comes to people in power. I think it's all of those. <laughs> yeah, even though I just discounted the potential impact, it's such a close race that a small number of votes might matter. And both candidates are trying to reach younger voters and specifically young male voters who might pay attention to what male athletes say. Hence, Tim Walls going on Twitch to stream Madden with AOC on Sunday. Also, Crazy Taxi. Shout out to the Sacred Dreamcast. We'll never forget you. But I think it's telling that maybe the most visible instances of active sports stars being tied to Trump or Harris this cycle, and these are examples that we probably haven't forgotten, unlike some of the actual endorsements, have had to do with Instagram likes. We had Caitlin Clark liking Taylor Swift's endorsement post and Swift's friend Brittany Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes' wife, liking and then unliking a 2024 GOP platform post, after which Trump came out and said that he liked her better than Taylor. And the response to both of the ensuing firestorms was for Clark and Mahomes to make comments in which they encourage people to vote, but also to do their own research, make their own conclusions, right? Not whom to vote for. So I wonder whether some athletes are looking around and seeing the backlash and not wanting to be part of that 
especially online right wing echo chamber targeting people who come out in support of certain candidates. You know, obviously there's going to be a backlash on both sides, depending on which candidate you support. And they might think, is this actually going to make a difference? How many people are persuadable? Do I really want to bring this upon myself? And, you know, there are probably people in our own personal lives who we just know at this point to stay away from this third rail (laughs) that no one's going to persuade anyone of everything and everyone will just be upset. So do you keep tilting at that windmill? Not to cite Trump's frequent target of windmills, which he tilts at also, but, you know, or do you just sort of sit it out and say, you know, I give up at this point in actually persuading anyone? And I wonder whether, you know, as Lindsay said, maybe it's the the male athletes who are sort of sitting out this cycle more so than the women. And maybe we're kind of regressing to the mean here a little bit because there was so much talk in 2016, 2020, especially about, wow, how newly political many athletes were being for the first time in decades. You know, of course, going back many years, there have always been outspoken athletes on many issues, but there had kind of been a quieting in that until 2020, until things really picked up. So maybe we're just going back to the modern norm now, and it seems like sort of a decline just in comparison to what we saw two years ago, four years ago. Ben, you mentioned a third rail. I have a a reasonably cynical, but I think pretty strong theory about part of what's happening in the NBA in particular this year, because that league and its players were so at the vanguard of political activity from the summer of 2020 onward. And I think that because of the temperature of this campaign, and particularly in progressive circles, the importance of the Palestinian liberation movement and the Palestinian conflict with Israel. I suspect that there are some NBA figures who are making business calculations. Not that we don't all make business calculations in our lives when we talk about these things, about whether they should get involved in this. And I think some of them are deciding not to. Yeah. And of course, there's been the controversy in recent years surrounding the NBA and China and comments by Dara Mori and Ennis Cantor and Dwight Howard, et cetera, about Hong Kong and Taiwan, different issues that we're just kind of conflating here under a broad umbrella of politics. But when you do have these business relationships or business aspirations, those things can cause crackdowns or just a, a whole lot of social media headaches that players may not want to deal with besieged as they are are already by people DMing them about uh, screwing up their gambling lines. So I <laughs> I can understand why people don't want to welcome that. But then again, you know, that's part of uh, being courageous and speaking up about things you believe in is sort of weathering the storm that sometimes ensues. Yeah, I think when you talked about Caitlin Clark, you know, the type of backlash she received from her followers, a lot of her fans um, saying you know, they were no longer fans of her because she liked a Taylor Swift post. That was, I think, really telling and probably eye opening for her as to where the discourse goes. Angel Reese also, I don't think, has issued a formal endorsement. And they were the two kind of names that I think would have broken through a little bit in the WNBA because there is so much attention around them. And because there is so much, uh, they haven't officially done this already, right? Brianna Stewart, Asia Wilson, um, you know, of course, with Don Staley, not in the WNBA, but obviously a big women's basketball figure. Like these are forces of nature that you already know where their vote and their their political affiliation lies. But Angel and Caitlin both with new fan bases. But I also understand why. You know, if you haven't been involved in politics much before and you're already dealing with this world changing platform and all this extra attention, this is quite the race to get into, especially when, you know, it changed so dramatically just a couple of months ago with the candidate change. I think that has to be brought into the fold as well. I think, you know, trying to figure out how to message around a new candidate when you're in the middle of your season is not the easiest thing to do in the world. The Seattle Storm, I want to note that they have officially endorsed candidates as a team before. Uh, They've always kind of been at the forefront of politics in sports, and they did officially endorse Harris and Waltz, and uh, that also received a lot of, why aren't you sticking to sports questions? But that's never who the Seattle Storm have been. And I mean, they held a Planned Parenthood rally back in 2016. You know, they've always been upfront about who they are. I just want to say, though, I am really disappointed in 
men right now, just in general. <laughs> it's nothing new. <laughs> but I think, you know, obviously my job is women's sports. So that's where most of my attention lies. And I have at times been a little bit disappointed at the lack of um, mobilization around this campaign in the women's sports leagues. But I think the biggest issues in this race revolve around issues of masculinity. And I think that we need more men who are in positions of power and who, you know, really embrace masculinity through sports, which is what we associate masculinity with the most almost, to speak up for women, to endorse a female candidate, and to speak up for reproductive rights, which are on the ballot and which are one of the main issues in this campaign. I think a lot of men felt more comfortable speaking up in previous campaigns, but don't feel as comfortable speaking up against about reproductive issues. And that is frustrating because I think those voices need to be heard. And I think that this should be an issue that men care about just as much as women care about. Another thing, though, is I feel like we have to mention that a way that sports has been brought into this campaign is trans women and trans women in sports being used as like a major point in the attack ads. And I wish that there were more women in sports speaking out specifically against that. Because look, I live in a swing state in North Carolina. The ad I see more than anything is the anti-trans ad from Donald Trump talking about how Kamala Harris supports men playing in women's sports as one of the things. And of course, also about transgender health care. And so that's a place where they are making that like their closing argument. And I wish we had more voices um, denouncing that. I do not live in a swing state, but I have also seen that more than anything else over the past (laughs) month, which has just been, well, once was more than enough. But LeBron lately has been tweeting about the best place to buy comic books. He wants to reconnect with his childhood love of Batman. I would not be shocked if he fired off a buzzer beating endorsement at some point over the next week. But like Caitlin Clark and Patrick Mahomes, I'll urge all of our hang up and listeners to vote. You can take in our next Monday episode as you go to your polling place on Tuesday. So I'll be voting for Harris, but I don't expect my endorsement to move the needle much. Speaking, by the way, of sports figures who have made business calculations over the courses of their careers as it relates to politics. The man credited with the quote, Republicans buy sneakers too, is involved in a fight in a different arena with NASCAR. We'll talk about it next. This episode is brought to you by Public.com. Did you know you can lock in a 6% or higher yield with a bond account at Public.com? The Federal Reserve recently announced a big rate cut, and there could be more rate cuts this year and in 2025 as well. That's good news if you're looking to buy a home, but it might not be so good for the interest rate you earn on your cash. So if you want to lock in a 6% or higher yield with a diversified portfolio of high-yield and investment-grade bonds, check out public.com. It only takes a couple of minutes to sign up. And once you lock in your yield, you can earn regular interest payments, even as rates decline. Lock in a 6% or higher yield with a bond account at public.com forward slash parade. But remember, your yield is not locked in until you invest. Brought to you by Public Investing, member FINRA and SIPC. As of September 26, 2024, the average annualized yield to worst across the bond account is greater than 6%. Yield to worst is not guaranteed. Not an investment recommendation. All investing involves risk. Visit public.com slash disclosures slash bond dash account for more info. If there's one thing sports fans love as much as watching games, it's talking about them, especially the stats. Here's one that's super simple to remember. Discover automatically doubles the cash back earned on your credit card at the end of your first year with Cash Back Match. That means with Discover, you could turn $150 cash back to $300. That's right. You could put it towards some memorabilia you've had your eye on or treat yourself to a premium sports network. You earn and Discover doubles. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Back here on Hang Up with Ben Lindbergh and Lindsay Gibbs, I am Alex Kirshner. 
Michael Jordan thinks NASCAR is a monopoly, and he is trying to do something about it. Earlier this month, Jordan's NASCAR team, 2311 Racing, and fellow team Front Row Motorsports sued the nation's top stock car race organizer and accused it of all sorts of bad behavior. The Jordan party says that NASCAR has essentially operated as a predatory bilking mechanism on behalf of the family that owns and operates it, the France family. The details might sound somewhat familiar to anyone who's followed, for example, the Justice Department's efforts to break up the owner of Ticketmaster due to that company's overarching control of the live music industry. Jordan's group has a series of problems with NASCAR. It says that it bars teams from racing another stock car series. I believe that is pretty much widely accepted to be true. It says that NASCAR buys up some of the best tracks on which NASCAR races in order to flex more financial muscle and control over the entire economic situation around the sport. And that NASCAR requires teams to buy parts from manufacturers handpicked by NASCAR, whether the teams want to or should be buying from those manufacturers at all. The Jordan suit says, quote, no other major professional sport in North America is run by a single family that enriches themselves through these kinds of unchecked monopolistic practices. NASCAR disagrees. It says Jordan's group is trying to weaponize discovery and that by restricting teams from racing elsewhere, it is just protecting its product. That's an argument not altogether different from the one the PGA Tour has made in preventing its players or seeking to prevent them from playing for Live Golf, the Saudi-backed alternative. Lindsay, is Michael Jordan just whining about a system that he agreed to partake in, or does he have a point, or yes? (laughs) The answer is always yes. Uh, Although, look, I have to just briefly harken back to our last segment. I cannot believe I did not mention the name Danica Patrick as athletes who have gotten themselves into this election. Uh, Danica Patrick is suddenly the biggest Trump supporter there is, of course, a former NASCAR driver. Uh, But anyways, and NASCAR also uh, has been on stage campaigning with Trump in the past. So, you know, these segments have a lot of connections. But absolutely, I think Jordan has a point. The way that one family has always been at the helm of NASCAR, passed down from father to son, and always had this dictator-like control over the sport and over what these different ownership teams and drivers are allowed to do. The fact that nobody knows how much money the France family makes from NASCAR or what their salaries are, it's all a little shady. And, you know, this all really escalated when they were working out this charter deal and trying to renegotiate these contracts with charters, which are kind of the way that NASCAR gives these teams their rights to operate as teams within the NASCAR system. And they, in September, just gave a 24-hour deadline and were like, if you don't agree to this, you're out. And so 13 out of the 15 teams agreed to this out of duress, with one of the owners anonymously saying to The Athletic that they felt like they were agreeing to it like with the gun pointed to their head. And it was Michael Jordan's team and then Front Row Racing who decided not to agree to this and hence this lawsuit. I think when you're asking how big of legs this lawsuit might have, the most important part here is Jeffrey Kessler, who is the high-powered lawyer who is on the case. He has been instrumental to the creation of NBA and NFL free agency, and more recently, the implementation of NIL deals in college sports, and he helped win equal pay for the U.S. women's national soccer team. So uh, he is known for completely transforming sports that are hesitant to be transformed. And the fact that he has taken this case on and the fact that, of course, Jordan has the money to actually fight this case, I think means we could be seeing real change coming to NASCAR sooner rather than later, which is exciting. Yeah, I love our segment Synergy today, sandwiching a Jordan topic between chats about LeBron 
By the way, George Carl has called on Jordan to endorse Kamala Harris. Jordan's daughter Jasmine has, but Jordan himself has not. Republicans buy NASCAR merch, too. In fact, (laughs) I would wager they buy the majority of it. So I guess there's further segment synergy in that we're in this anti-monopoly, anti-non-compete regulatory environment. That's been a big thing under the Biden administration, which will certainly change if Trump wins and may also change to some extent even if Harris wins. So probably both sides are watching the political headwinds here. Also, we're going to talk about J.J. Reddick's team in the next segment. Let's not forget about Tyler Reddick, no relation, who drives for Jordan's team and won the NASCAR Cup Series regular season championship. Also won at Homestead Miami Speedway on Sunday to earn a spot in the championship race, a first for Jordan's team. And Jordan said in response to that latest victory, and I quote, little kid drove his ass off. (laughs) Tyler Reddick is five foot five. That is pretty little compared to Michael Jordan. So maybe Jordan can find success as a NASCAR owner that eluded him as an NBA owner. We'll see whether he finds that success on the court or in the court, rather. He has certainly done the former, not yet the latter. And he's kind of an interesting figurehead here because, you know, the filing called NASCAR monopolistic bullies. And as something of a bully himself, Jordan takes that personally, I'm sure. And during the 2011 NBA lockout, he led the hardline owners who wanted to cap the player's share of revenue at 47 percent, which prompted them to consult with antitrust lawyers. And then during the 98-99 lockout, he was critical of owners. So whatever his role, you can always count on MJ to tirelessly advocate for his own bottom line, (laughs) usually pretty successfully. So yes, the combination of Jordan and Kessler, whom Sportico called the Michael Jordan of sports antitrust litigation, seems to be a pretty potent combination. I'm not a lawyer, so it's hard for me to analyze the specifics of the filings here. But it is kind of an interesting case because the plaintiffs are claiming that even though NASCAR competes with F1 and IndyCar, stock car racing is its own market, whereas NASCAR will be claiming that actually NASCAR is just part of racing as a whole. And so it is competing with these other forms of racing, right? Which, you know, seems reasonable on some level. It does seem reasonable on some level, although in my experience, the two sports have, there's certainly a Venn diagram with a middle section, but they have largely non-overlapping audiences. Mm -hmm. And there are European style racing snobs who really look down on stock car racing. And there are stock car racing snobs who really look down on F1. I think they look down less on IndyCar because it is not European and it's a little bit more part of the fabric of the American spirit, if you will. But it's it's an interesting question that it will have to, to some extent, it seems, be litigated whether NASCAR is competing with other racing series globally. Like right. That is an interesting question to me, and I like that a judge will have to or a jury <laughs> will have to ultimately weigh in on that. Yeah, and that's not the only interesting question at hand here. There's, there's the single entity defense. This is kind of a core peg of the case. So NASCAR is unlike most of the other sports leagues that we talk about on Hang Up and Listen, MLB or the NFL or the NBA, and that it's owned by the France family and thus arguably isn't acting in concert with franchises. It's not acting at the behest of those franchises who make up the league. However, NASCAR teams are independently owned, even though NASCAR, the business, is family founded and owned. So it's kind of a unique sort of structure. And then you can also say, well, the the plaintiffs will argue, you know, NASCAR is so lucrative. Look how much money it makes as a result of this favorable arrangement. And NASCAR can come back and say, well, it wouldn't be a viable business. If not, that's why it has thrived to the extent that it has, that we have this leeway to operate. And you can say, well, there are exclusivity provisions across a lot of sports, right, to enhance competition and ensure competitive balance and make sure that these leagues survive. You mentioned the PGA Tour, this coming up before UFC, same thing, right? just saying, well, we can't compete unless we have this sort of arrangement that limits the the freedoms of the participants. And I guess NASCAR has had some success defending that stance in the past with the Kentucky Speedway versus NASCAR in 2009, which was another antitrust lawsuit that uh, the Sixth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals rejected. And, you know, maybe there will be the same sort of conclusion here, but it is a different political environment. And this time you have his heirness and Kessler going after them. It's interesting because usually these 
lawsuits and especially for Jeffrey Kessler when he's, you know, at the helm of these lawsuits, it's to help the labor itself, right? But in this case, it's (laughs) because the owners of these individual teams aren't like really part of NASCAR ownership, right? Like it's not it's not like in the NFL where Roger Goodell technically works for the owners, right? In this case, it's um you know, the owners are working for Brian France. So there's this extra layer uh put in there where I don't I wonder keep wondering like how much does any of this help the actual drivers and are any of these entities really have the labor rights of the drivers at the forefront of the best interest, you know, everyone in ownership is going to be crying poor. And that is from the NASCAR front office all the way to the ownerships of these individual teams. And so that's what make possible financial disclosures so interesting because we get to see how everyone is cooking the books. But I do really think that's important to note is that at the end of the day, this isn't uh, Michael Jordan fighting for the little guy and fighting for labor. <laughs> like he is fighting for other owners of these teams, but they're against an even more evil like entity and more selfish owner. So the way that NASCAR is set up is so interesting. And look, one of the reasons why I didn't, I, I'm from North Carolina. So obviously I grew up knowing about NASCAR and uh, having races on in the background, but it wasn't until I was freelancing for Bleacher Report about 10 years ago. And they just kept asking me to do stuff. They were like, can you write columns about NASCAR now? And I needed the, you know, hundred dollars or whatever it was they were paying. And I just said, absolutely. Absolutely. And so I started following it on a weekend, we got basis. And one of the reasons I ended up really loving that was because it is about the same 20 people on a weekend, we got basis, like driving, you know, to the death almost uh, against each other and fighting things out. You're not dealing with uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of athletes and storylines. And I think this all does make everything a little bit richer. Like if uh, Reddick, you know, Jordan's driver can win the whole thing this season with, while they are suing NASCAR, like that's an interesting layer. NASCAR has had, by the way, a handful of times over its history, organizing skirmishes, efforts to organize the drivers into some sort of union or association or or this, that, or the other. And the France family has been vehemently and effectively opposed to that and has managed to stave it off, which will surprise, I imagine, zero listeners to this podcast. So it is, uh, I think it's a, a really good question, Lindsay, whether any of this ultimately filters to, to helping the drivers in any way. And it's not entirely clear to me how it would, but... Maybe it's the kind of thing, particularly if NASCAR is weakened via the suit, maybe if you're a Denny Hamlin or or another driver who has been sort of involved in the past in trying to, to set up one of these organizations, maybe you see a little blood in the water and you use that as, a, as an occasion to try to come together in some form or fashion. Though I think forming a NASCAR union would be pretty hard. Yeah, I mentioned Jordan's quote about little kid drove his ass off. If Jordan ends up helping the little guy here, I think that will be an accident. <laughs> that is not his primary goal. But <laughs> Tyler Reddick, by the way, said that his boss, Jordan, is a big trash talker as an owner. Shocking, I know. And that he doesn't know that much about racing, but he's trying to learn, which I suppose makes two of us. I think we can all agree that the most important job of any lawyer involved with any major sports league or promotion or what have you is the lawyer who does the antitrust stuff and argues to judges and to politicians, no, we're not violating antitrust law. That's crazy. We would never do that. Up next, the NBA is back. The biggest story of the season's first week is about a player who played all of three minutes with no points scored and one rebound. And there are storylines abounding in a new season of men's professional basketball. We'll talk about it. As a winner of Apple Podcasts' Show of the Year Award, Code Switch knows that identity is part of every story. 
Code Switch is interested in how race and identity shape your world in real and confusing and sometimes funny ways. From discussions with comedians of color about what makes a good race joke to how questions of identity swirl around reality TV, Dungeons and Dragons, and BBLs, Code Switch guides you through all the different spaces that people of color live in and what it's like to navigate them. Code Switch doesn't just talk to you about race and identity in the abstract. It tackles real, everyday questions like how to create boundaries with immigrant parents or tips on how to speak to family members whose racial views might feel stuck in the Stone Age. Every new episode of Code Switch feels like a love letter to the ways race and identity are always connected and how your life, no matter who you are, is made richer by thinking through them. Listen now to Code Switch from NPR wherever you get your podcasts. I said to Roger, the last thing you are, fair and balanced. That should have been my slogan. <laughs> When the Fox News Channel first went on the air, it promised to change television. Few broadcasts take any chances these days, and most are very politically correct. Well, we're going to be different. It's going to be kick-ass, and I want to be part of it. I'm Josh Levine. In this season of Slow Burn, we'll look at the moment in the early 2000s when Fox News became a political and cultural force. I'm okay with wearing an American flag. And if you're not, I think you need to examine who you are. You'll hear from Fox insiders, many who've never spoken out before. I was not told about that beforehand for good reason. I wouldn't have gone along with it. And you'll hear from the activists and comedians who tried to stop it. He said, you're being sued by Fox. And I went, really? That's fabulous. Slow Burn Season 10, The Rise of Fox News. Hear the entire season now, wherever you listen. <laughs> Hey, everyone. It's Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? It's been a long road to Election Day. How you doing? Uh... We've had crazy cat ladies, coconut trees, not to mention a little last-minute candidate swap. The polling indicates where they're slipping. I think viewers saw something other than what they were expecting. In an election that seems as close as this one does, you know, any one of these little factors can matter so much. But after all that, here we are, at the end of the road. Or maybe it's just the beginning. And What Next has got you covered every step of the way for November 5th and the aftermath. We'll have all the deep insights and tongue-in-cheek political analysis you know and love from Slate. So don't miss out. Follow and listen wherever you get your podcasts. With my friends Lindsay Gibbs and Ben Lindbergh, I'm Alex Kirshner. LeBron James Jr., who goes by Bronny, played in an NBA game last week. It was a bit farcical, as Bronny did not have the kind of college resume or physical measurables that would typically get a player even to the G League, let alone a guaranteed contract and an opening night appearance off the bench for the Los Angeles Lakers. But it was a cool moment for LeBron James, the elder, and I certainly paid attention to it. So I guess I cannot complain to the extent that I thought it was a stunt because I was watching and that made it very good for business. There's a business case for having Bronny on the Lakers, of course, and the NBA is a business. It must have been really cool for LeBron and LeBron's agent, Rich Paul, who now represents a bunch of star players to see Bronny out there. And as certain observers, like now former ESPN insider Adrian Wojnarowski, have opined in recent months, maybe in service to Rich Paul, I don't know, nepotism is pretty rampant in all corners of the NBA. So it's maybe not the biggest scandal in the world that it finally filtered down to a bench player on a team. It's a bit weird. In a four-man photo up on the court with the Ken Griffey's senior and junior, Bronny was the analog to junior, one of the best hitters of all time. Ben, did you find that to be as uh, <laughs> odd as I did? Yeah, I know that James's and Griffey's are longtime friends, but I think Tim Raines Jr. might be a better comp. Tim Raines' son. Seems a little bit more fair. Yeah. yeah, who debuted on the 2001 Orioles as a teammate of his future Hall of Famer father. Played a total of 75 big league games and finished with 0.2 war. So if you were making comps, <laughs> that might make more sense. But, you know, get the Griffey's and the Jameses together. That's a cool foursome. But yeah, on the one hand... Bronny is, I guess, you know, the biggest sports nepo baby example you could come up with, most likely. He clearly wouldn't be earning any NBA minutes at this point if not for who his dad is. But on the other hand, I, I suppose he, he is a Nepo baby along with Nepo father who you can root for to some extent. It's, uh, you know, kind of a heartwarming story aside from the obvious favoritism and privilege at play here. Bronny has been through a lot with his heart troubles. LeBron has wanted to play with his son for so long. We've all been aware of that. We can perhaps, if we're parents, put ourselves in his place and say, oh, yeah, wouldn't that be wonderful? And, you know, if they do it, 
like they did it in this game, where it was a few minutes when the Lakers were up 16 points with four minutes to go. I guess the Lakers were minus five, if you look at the plus minus with both Jameses on the floor, but didn't matter in this situation. You could imagine that it might matter in some situations because the Lakers won the NBA Cup last year, but barely made the playoffs via the play in tournament lost in the first round, didn't do much to improve over the offseason and will probably be on the bubble again. If not for Bronny's presence, we'd probably be talking trade with LeBron. So if he were getting a ton of minutes and hurting the team's chances, then it would probably be a less sweet story and more, okay, <laughs> let's get the unqualified kid out of here unless and until he is actually good enough to be on the floor. So, you know, when LeBron said after they both got into this game, we weren't trying to make it about us. We wanted to make it about the team. Well, it's not going to be about the team. It's about you guys. <laughs> and yet in limited quantities, maybe we're kind of okay with that. Yeah, look, I was... A little icked by the whole thing, <laughs> like during the draft and all the talk leading up to it. But I actually think that JJ Reddick, who I have to keep reminding myself is the new head coach of the Lakers. As podcasters, it's nice to see a pipeline to that type of work, though. <laughs> Representation so. <laughs> matters so much. It's yeah. definitely the, the most qualified I've ever felt to be an <laughs> NBA head coach. But, you know, I think JJ's done a really good job of handling this whole thing by not actually pretending that it's normal and not actually pretending like it's business as usual. You know, they kind of leaned into it. And I think, you know, going into that first game with the Griffies on the sidelines, it was very clear that they wanted to have this be a moment, but you know, JJ had said only if the flow of the game, like if there's an opportunity, they were up big at the end of that first half. I was so glad that it happened at the end of that first half so that I could go to bed because I too on the East Coast was waiting up for it to happen. Uh, and it was pretty cool. And then he hasn't seen the court since. It's not like they're playing him every game. It's not like they're putting him in the starting lineup. He's going to travel with the team on this uh, road trip likely will not play on this road trip. And then they're sending him to the G League uh, and he'll kind of go back and forth this season. So I think it's really good they got this appearance, this joint appearance out of the way. They've done the press conferences and the moment has happened. And I do, it's, it's hard to say that it's been a distraction for the team or that it's been inherently bad for the team, which is where I would really have a problem with it, right? That's where it would get to be if he is, um, if it looked to be negatively impacting the locker room situation or, um, you know, chemistry. But I think it's bought, brought out the best in LeBron. I think he's been really, really um, focused. I mean, he's been phenomenal to start the season, averaging 23 points, 7.7 .7 rebounds, 7.3 assists, including against Sacramento. He had 32 points, including 16 in the fourth quarter to help he's lead a comeback win. Yeah. I mean, this guy is, this is unstoppable. <laughs> he's absolutely unstoppable. And... You know, to Bronny's defense, defending Nepo babies is not my, you know, usually my occupation here on podcast, but you don't hear anything about a lack of work ethic or about him, you know, having an ego or creating problems in practices. Uh, Lakers assistant coach Scott Brooks has said that, you know, he has a lot of professionalism. He's on time. He's coachable. He's working every day. He's patient with the ups and downs and... You know, I think that that goes a long way. It's like when people would complain about um, Tanasis being on the box, uh, Giannis's brother, and it was like, well, sure, but from all accounts, he makes things better for Giannis, and he works really hard in practice and does his job and is good for spirit, which is like for the 15th player on the roster – that's yeah. that's kind yeah. of the yeah. job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if if Bronny were known to be uh, entitled or arrogant or feeling like, you know, he he owned the place, then yeah, maybe you you wouldn't uh, feel as permissive about it or, you know, if LeBron, I mean, from afar, he seems like a a loving, caring dad. So, it's uh, you know, as these things go, uh, I guess Bronny is almost like the Jack Quaid of sports in terms of like Nepo babies we can feel kind of okay about. But, you know, there's so many 
athletes, as you mentioned in the intro, Alex, it's just so common for NBA players, kids, or, you know, any sports players, kids to follow in their parents' footsteps that we're kind of used to it. It's kind of priced in. And that's, you know, nature and nurture. It's the bloodlines. It's the genes. It's also having LeBron to coach you from infancy, right? And, you know, you almost uh, on some level feel some slight sympathy for Bronny, maybe just the weight of expectations. You know, LeBron obviously had a huge weight of expectations and spotlight placed on him from a young age, but that was because of his own performance and and incipient greatness. Whereas Bronny, so much has been expected of him. He's been kind of anointed as the kid who was going to play with his dad someday for years and years and years. And so he's had to deal with that too. And, you know, even though we see so many second generation, third generation players, Tom Haberstroh had some research earlier this year for Yahoo Sports that suggested that second generation players in the NBA have historically been underrated, if anything. So who knows? Maybe Bronny will turn out to be a better player than anyone thinks. And even though we have seen the phenomenon of juniors following in their father's footsteps so many times, it's still incredibly rare and novel for it to happen while the dad is still playing. <laughs> you just got Gordie Howe and his sons and the Griffies and the Reigns's and that's about it. You know, let alone having the dad still be not at the peak of his powers, but absolutely still one of the best players in the league by the time that his son comes around, which is just an incredible testament to LeBron's longevity. So all of those things add up to, yes, probably many NBA fans are sick of this story and are saying, can we just focus on actual NBA caliber players here and not someone who is barely playing at all? I do understand that. But I also understand why it's an object of curiosity, because it has been for for me as well. These are interesting times for professional basketball in Los Angeles in general. Lindsay, you had the good idea that if we were going to talk about the Brawny story and risk fatiguing our listeners who may be <laughs> sick and tired of hearing about Brawny, that we should also do a bit of show and tell with storylines in the NBA at the beginning of this season that you find particularly worth following and that you can't get enough of. Mine, just because we're on the Los Angeles topic, but then I'm very interested in yours, is the Clippers move out of the Lakers' shadow to the newly built Intuit Dome in Englewood next to the Rams Chargers NFL Cathedral that is over there, a little bit closer to the Los Angeles airport. I am quite interested in this basketball arena for two reasons. Number one is that the Microsoft billionaire Steve Ballmer, who owns the team, actually paid for it himself, not that he's not using the team to dodge taxes and do all those sorts of things that I'm sure are in his self-interest, but he paid for it himself, which I like. He put a lot of toilets in it because his <laughs> animating ideology about this seems to be that we shouldn't have bathroom lines. Uh, and the Clippers are also doing something that I have not seen done in the NBA, which is the so-called wall, a an extremely vertically angled section of seats in one of the end zones where if you are not a Clippers fan, if you're, for instance, wearing the other team's clothing, they will remove you from that section that is in the terms when you buy your ticket, and they will take you out of there because that section is only for Clippers fans. Kevin Durant has already been among the players who have visited to opine that this is pretty cool. Maybe it's a small step towards NBA crowds being a bit more boisterous in the way that we see with basketball overseas. I can't imagine that the Clippers will ever be cool anywhere or in Los Angeles. I still don't see many of their fans walking around on a day-to-day -day basis, but I think this is a nice step forward. And uh, them playing in, in an arena that isn't known as the Lakers arena is probably good for them. Lindsay, what do you have for us? <laughs> well, I just, you know, I, I'm kind of rooting for the Clippers to become cool. Like, <laughs> I just feel so sad for them from afar. <laughs> I don't know why. Really hoping they get together. Although I do think that if you want the wall to be a little bit more, you know, average fan, maybe uh, all parking shouldn't be $70 for the game. Like, that's just a little, maybe. a little tip. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> there was a, if you've been on uh, the, the platform formerly known as Twitter lately, you know that it's turned into just LinkedIn posts, like LinkedIn bros, you know, verified and posting. And someone was complaining about the price of the parking and someone else goes, but maybe this will also just motivate the next generation to work harder so that they can afford parking prices. And, it, you know, that's, that's the spirit. <laughs> that's the fandom we're talking about. Um, anyways, you know, I 
had a few things that I wanted to mention, and I will. But right now, all I can really think about is Dwayne Wade's statue reveal in Miami. Did you guys see <laughs> the Dwayne Wade statue? <laughs> yeah. Are you sure it was a Dwayne Wade statue? No, I am not. Looks much more like Udonis Haslam or some, or maybe Dwayne Wade, like, in 50 years. It was horrific. <laughs> yeah. I saw some Fraser Crane comps, at, in fact, which is not what you want in this case. But yeah, no, this is the Ronaldo statue yet again. I, I But that was, was only a bust. Like, that was movable. True. That was in an airport. That was not outside his <laughs> arena. Like, yeah. this is on Dwayne Wade uh, Avenue or whatever. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta do something. We have to have some sort of cross-sports uh, commission to do something about the likenesses on, on sports statues and busts and pedestals. Because I complained about the MLB Hall of Fame plaques this past year that looked absolutely nothing like Joe Maurer and Adrian Beltre and co according to those players themselves. So I don't know, you know, it's a difficult medium to work in. I will give them that. It's not like I could do any better, but it seems like there should be some vetting here, you know, at least run it by the statue subject before you display it. It's just so funny. All the memes are cracking me up. They've um, taken the iconic photo of Dwayne Wade um, <laughs> with his arms out and LeBron James back uh, dunking in the background, the Heatles photo, and like put the statue's face on Wade's face. <laughs> it's just really funny because it is not Dwayne Wade's face. Like it is absolutely <laughs> in no way his face. But anyways, you know, statue tangents aside, Right now, I'm in a little bit of an adjustment phase because typically in the NBA, like my feel good teams are the Bucks and the Nuggets, um, mainly because I just love the personalities of their stars so much of Giannis and Jokic. Uh, But they have had a really rough start to the season, so not as great of vibes. I love LaMelo Ball, the Hornets. Uh, I'm open to there being some success there, and, you know, I'm going to keep my eye on it. They did have a great win over the Houston Rockets on opening night in Houston. But I have to say the Oklahoma City Thunder, I think, are going to be my team for the season. The vibes on that team are impeccable. After every game, they do these post-game interviews with the local um reporter and they all gather around and they all bark and they all are just like they look like the happiest bros on the face of the planet and it brings me a lot of joy they're very talented they're very easy to root for there's um you know they're fun games to watch and it's not a market that is you know it's not Boston, is what I'm saying, <laughs> which I just still cannot find any joy in the Celtics no. domination. I'm sorry. Uh, no. I love Drew Holiday, but the, the Celtics bring me zero joy. So kind of all in on the thunder right now and um, also just really excited to see where that goes. And I'm going to keep an eye on the Knicks. The Knicks drama always intrigues me and how Carl Anthony Towns is treated in, uh, in New York City is just... One of the scariest storylines, I think, but also one of the most intriguing. Yeah. Ben, are you going to, are you and your compatriots in New York going to (laughs) treat Carl Anthony Towns with the respect that he deserves? Because I would admit that when one of the NBA's more vulnerable, open, mental health advocating advocating players went to the Knicks, I was like, uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about this one. Yeah, just dreading the, can he play in New York? Is he tough enough to handle the big stage sort of narrative? But that's certainly one of the storylines I'm most interested. Can the Knicks pull a liberty and finally win one? I'm with Lindsay on the Clippers, too. You know, the Lakers got winning time. The Clippers got clipped, the tagline for which was the scandalous story of LA's other basketball team. So maybe it's a time for the Clippers to get their winning time. And then, yeah, the historic rivals of those winning time showtime Lakers. The Celtics, I am wondering whether they can be unseated or will they put a stop to this recent run of championship parody, this anti-dynastic era we're in with six seasons and six different champions. Will that continue or can they repeat? And of course, everyone's wondering how much better will Wemby be? I'm sure that will come up on this podcast at some point. But as someone who's always into the metagame, I'm wondering whether this will be the 
year that three-point shooting finally breaks some barrier where it just becomes unpalatable to everyone. And I know people have talked about that before, but after the huge increases in three-point shooting during the 2010s, the three-point attempt rate had largely leveled off over the past several seasons. But last year, speaking of the Celtics, they had one of the best seasons ever with a 47% three-point attempt rate. And now the copycat league cliche comes into play. This preseason, the league-wide rate was a record 44.1%. It's been 42% in the early going in the regular season. So even if it comes down a bit, it will probably break the 40% barrier. I wonder whether that will reignite talk of needing to do something like moving the line back after a a few years of seeming stagnation. On the three-pointer subject, I always love talking about three-pointers early in the season because as of right now, there is a qualifying NBA player Jaime Jaquez Jr. of the Miami Heat, who is still shooting 100% from beyond the arc with enough to qualify. He's four for four. I hope that he continues that all season. You too. We'll see if he can do it. That is all for this episode. We also have a bonus show that is live right now about Fernando Mania, whose proprietor, Fernando Valenzuela, passed away last week just before his beloved Los Angeles Dodgers started playing the World Series. To hear that, you can subscribe to Slate Plus on Apple Podcasts by clicking Try Free at the top of our show page, or visit slate.com forward slash hangup plus to get access wherever you listen. The episode is available right now, and we will see you there. Our show notes are at slate.com slash hangup, and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. Don't forget to follow the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. And for Ben Lindbergh and Lindsay Gibbs, I'm Alex Kirshner. Remember Zelmo Beatty, and thank you for listening. <laughs>